Okay, I am going to make a video all about adhesives, but it's extensive and there's tons of information to share. So I'm prepping some stuff. I started a little mini project and while I was working with this soldering iron for a custom application, I realized there's some things that a lot of people probably don't know that they can do. What you're looking at is just a trial of mine that I'm going to perform where we, uh, instead of scuffing the surface of a plastic that's bad at adhesion, we're going to give it um, little ridges through melting. And I wanted an easy tool to do that and make it repeatable so I can specify when we get results, this is exactly how you do it and how deep, how hot, etc. This is my soldering iron that's usually just sitting in the drawer while I use my good one for most projects. And you'll notice um, in this case, I have a brass uh, pin that can be used for injecting the threaded inserts into um, any different plastic, okay? But we don't have temperature control on here, yet I can still control the temperature and I'll show you how. At this point, the iron has been operating for several minutes and you'll notice that the solder is still hanging on and holding brass to aluminum. Forgive my awful botched up job of soldering here. That is not the point of the video at all. So this iron gives us a constant 40 something watts and you'll notice here we have a quarter inch shank on the tool that you can insert and then just secure it with that little screw. And anything that you want to insert that's a quarter inch will go in and hopefully conduct heat if you choose something like copper, brass, or even steel to some degree. This tool is called the pipe cutter and it costs about eight hours of parking at Texas A&M. And it's great for brass and copper and I probably should not use it for stainless steel, but I'm gonna do it anyway. And you get just a little bit of deformation at the tip. You work with copper or brass, you can take care of that easily and consistently with a chamfer tool. Here's an invention that you should not try at home, but if you do, I'd love to know how quickly this can heat up a cup of coffee. In my trials for adhesion, I went to put grooves in this plastic that are more pronounced than just what you get with sandpaper. And so I grabbed some of these heat sinks. They can come with CPUs for like Raspberry Pi, or they might come with um, motor drivers, or in this case, these are for the drivers of the stepper motors on a 3D printer. And when I replaced drivers, there were plenty of spares. So now the question is, can I heat this to a temperature that is constant and consistent? and enough to melt the plastic, but not burn the plastic and not melt solder. We could use a rod, but I have a tube. And so we can't just fit a fastener through the aluminum and into the copper. And instead I wanted to uh, have a lower temperature anyway. And that means I can probably solder these two together. I started by drilling a hole just deep enough that there's a groove for this to rest in. And then there will be a small gap that wicks in the solder when I heat it up. Now here's how I'm going to control the temperature. I have a heat source here, which is the resistive element that's going to be consistently giving 42 watts of uh, heating power. This experiment just got super exciting because it touches on one of the most difficult courses in mechanical engineering, and then one of the easiest examples thereof, where we usually start this course with a one dimension evaluation, where heat is being evaluated along one axis, and then one mode of heat transfer, and that in our case is passive convection. So we have a temperature profile where this axis is temperature. And then we have a heat gradient from the source to wherever my, my work zone is. It's so oversimplified that the engineers in the classroom are going, how in the world could this ever be applicable? And here today we find an application. So we have the temperature of a uh, rod with the heat supplied here and a high temperature that is coming from our resistive element. And then we have convection uh, to the air that drops the temperature across this axis. And then you have basically your ambient somewhere here. This would be the room temperature. And this is, if the bar is very long, this is known to be extremely close to ambient. If it's shorter, then we find ourselves somewhere here. And that's basically a guarantee that your temperature drops strongly at the beginning and then less and less strongly. 
and that gives us control to basically slide this guy and change the temperature of the tip. In my case, uh, most of these irons, I think you can get these even as low as like $5 or $1 at the dollar store. You can loosen this and then, oh yeah, this is cooled down. Um, we can slide this to different lengths. And with that length, you will achieve a different temperature on the tip. All right, and this is steady state. So that means we're also not handling the changing temperatures. We are not dealing with transients. Also, a low enough temperature that we don't melt this solder joint. Again, ugly solder joint, we can do better. I found that my iron is a little more powerful than I need, and if I slide this in too far, then it's hot enough to melt the solder. And then what you get there is something like this for the shorter distance. Oops. I found that this temperature here was too hot, and this temperature here is maybe going to be satisfactory. Hold up, I gotta give you a reason why I drew a second line that comes here instead of just tracing back on my original graph. So consider this zone in the hot pipe where energy is leaving the system and that energy has to go somewhere. We didn't actually have a constant temperature, but we did have a constant power. So the watt edge is here and this doesn't move by very much or also we're not tracking it. So you need to know that the temperature will be higher and it will be higher by the amount of energy you are not pushing out of the system in this part of the pipe that no longer exists. So you could basically equate these two areas. Keep in mind in this theory stuff, I'm not describing the situation that uh, of changes from having this heat sink at the end. I'm treating the whole process as two stages where first we control the temperature of this tip, the tip where I will apply the heat, uh, the, this heat exchanger. And I know that if I raise the temperature of that point, I will raise the temperature of my exchanger. And if I lower the temperature of that point, I will lower the temperature of the exchanger. And I, this whole time, I don't need to know that temperature. I just have to be able to increase or decrease it. And if I need it to be even hotter, if it wasn't hot enough and I wanna be up here, then I could even insulate around the sides. If you grab a piece of silicone and start insulating the zone before the iron's tip, then you trap more heat in here and the temperature is higher at the end. With this insulation, I have a controller here, but let's say I didn't. With a static power, I can add this and raise the temperature at the end, or I can have uh, less power consumption. Let's say I am controlling the temperature of the tip. I will achieve the same temperature with a reduced power consumption. And in my case, I'm able to read that with my watt meter. In the end, the soldering situation was too finicky and I came up with going back to the threaded situation. So now we have a way to put threads in this tube and we have the temperature nice. You'll see no smoke and that we can put marks in the plastic. And we could adjust this, uh, this length to get temperatures different for different types of plastic. To get threads in my brass, permanently fixed, I used one of these threaded rivets, or a riv nut, as people commented frustratingly on one of my shorts. The tool looks like that, and it is akin to a rivet gun, and it, it will squish this zone to compress your body, in this case, stainless steel, but they also come in aluminum, doesn't matter. Then we can have this section bulging out and clamping inside of the brass. Then we have a situation where you can clamp anything you want using a screw and it's going to thread into the riv rivet uh, threads, just like this example. Now that we have threads on this thing, just imagine all the stuff you could attach and control the temperature for it. Uh, you're not imagining, are you? Well, just to sprout some ideas, we have all these different uh, threaded inserts that go into plastic that you may want to melt in. 
the wood burning kits you see at the hobby store use this exact same setup it's just a different tip so you can do art you could easily drill a little hole and put your thermocouple in here to monitor the temperature and toggle on and off the power to get it where you need it and you could also pump air in here this is a heat proof silicone tube you can get this stuff with aquarium pumps and for like a five dollar aquarium pump then you have a nice controlled airflow that could be exiting here and you could tap into that if you have some mechanical skills for my audience, please keep in mind that this video is an effort to spur creativity. I'm sure it has errors. I would love to hear your inputs in the comments if I've overlooked something. And uh, consider that I think my audience is this electronics developers crowd, sort of technicians, sort of engineers, and an introductory level to the thermodynamics and the heat transfer can bring them a long way. Rather than worrying about the perfection in each of the disciplines that are involved. I want to provide information that's not already there. So hopefully you enjoyed or learned something and see you next time.